policies and procedures. Now, I must say that this is by far not my favorite topic. I honestly don't know anyone whose favorite topic is this. Or, I don't know, maybe I'm just not part of the right circles. But anyway, we have to cover this as well, because the, the exam might ask you about some of the ideas that we'll be talking in here. We're going to talk about policies and procedures, because there is never going to be a technical control, a security device that will not be vulnerable to the human factor. So humans can be and are the weakest link in pretty much any kind of cybersecurity context. And also the first step in an organization should be keeping this human weakest link under control. So to do this, we're going to need some well-defined security policies. And one of the things that characterizes a security policy is the fact that you're mostly going to follow a set of rules or a guidance document that is going to help you reach that secure state using policies and procedures. And this kind of guidance, we're going to call it a framework. So a framework is just a method to make order from chaos or a blueprint for implementing security. And we have different frameworks for different aspects of security. Uh, some of these are just for certification purposes. So you just need them to prove that you have done your homework uh, to a legal authority or to a parent company, for example. Just to mention a couple of these, uh, we're going to start with NIST. That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It has a risk-based framework. Uh, ISO should also be mentioned. They also have a cybersecurity framework along with IEC. Uh, TOGAF, again, it's a standard for enterprise security architecture modeling, which is basically a way of saying how to design those policies and those procedures. Uh, SABSA is about information assurance, also risk analysis. Uh, COBIT, it's about IT governance. It's an IT governance framework, which is specifically focused on security. And uh, finally, we have uh, ITIL, uh, which includes some best practices for aligning IT and businesses, also from a security perspective, not necessarily focused on security, but they are touching on this topic as well. Now, just a brief mention here, even though it's not included on the slide, an ESA, that's an enterprise security architecture. We also have ESA frameworks, which uh, are made up as entire lists of activities and objectives that a company follows in order to reduce and mitigate risk. Now, a framework, as I said before, tries to bring order to the madness. It's the highest level policy in a company. And as the highest level policy, we use it to help an organization realize their current security or cybersecurity capabilities or where they should uh, be in the future and where we should prioritize the investments to reach that desired state. Now, since there's no exact science in this area, as you can probably guess, there's a lot of frameworks out there because a lot of people had a lot of different ideas about how to govern this process of managing IT and specifically cybersecurity. And I actually have about two categories here. So first we have the category of prescriptive frameworks. Now these are going to be backed by regulations or compliance requirements. And among the ones that we've already talked about, this is where we find things like COBIT, uh, which stands for Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies. It's not an exact acronym, I know. <laughs> we also have ITIL here. Um, we also have the International Organization of Standardizations, that's ISO. Specifically, we should mention ISO 27001, right? This one is specifically about information security and also the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, also known as PCI TSS. Now, how well these frameworks are implemented is measured as a level of maturity within a company. That's because most organizations start by being reactive, uh, which basically means we get attacked, we do something, we learn how to defend. Well, these frameworks try to move the behavior towards a more proactive one, where you raise your defenses before the first attack hits you. How well your defenses looks like? Well, that's the actual maturity level or model of your chosen framework. So for example, a first level would be just having risk assessments. And that's it. It's, it's on paper. <laughs> and that's where it ends. Next level would mean that you have some policies and procedures in place. So now you're getting somewhere. 
Now, the third level would be a deep integration of the security policies and procedures into your business processes. And also, this is the level where you should have something to continuously monitor how well those policies and procedures are being followed. And should you also have some ways of evaluate and mitigate any potential risks that might occur from now on, right? Not just at the moment of the policy's definition. Now, the second category is about risk-based frameworks and risk-based frameworks address the, the problem of this prescriptive frameworks that we just talked about. That is, some organizations adapt those frameworks and simply check the box on paper next to the firewall, next to the IDS, next to the SIEM appliance, next to the, the backup appliance, but nobody bothers anymore to check the thousands of alerts generated a day, generated by the SIEM or the constant attacks uh, deflected by the IDS uh, system. So risk-based frameworks admit that, well, there is no universal framework that applies to everyone. We know this, not even in the same industry. Everybody is different, everybody is special. So instead they say something like, you know, do your homework, your internal risk assessment, have a list of what exactly matters to you and then we'll discuss and then we'll start from there so one example uh, here is going to be the nest cybersec framework uh, which is made up of a couple of components first we have the um, the framework core which identifies the five cybersec functions which we should address like you know how to identify threats how to protect from them how to detect them a uh, continuous detection that is how to respond to a threat or to attack and how to recover after an unfortunate incident uh, also another component is the implementation and we have this uh, defined uh, under a number of tiers sort of a maturity level if you want right like the ones that we've discussed before so this this tier level this maturity level is going to describe how the core elements are integrated within the company's processes so we could be looking at something just partially integrated we're just getting started or risk informed this is where we know about the risks and we just haven't done anything about them yet <laughs> right? it's still something right it's not nothing the next one might be repeatable right we know what we're doing and we keep doing it but we're not thinking ahead and last one would be adaptive it's not only repeatable, but we're continuously improving the processes. So we have some sort of a feedback loop generated by this, uh, this continuous monitoring. And finally, we have also the framework profiles. And this is a term which means that we should have an actual list of statements about what we have and what we need. So this is what is going to be used for future investments. We have to be able to uh, put a finger on a, on a list of uh, security controls or appliances or policies that need to be implemented. So where should the money go to better protect ourselves? Now, as you can see, these risk-based frameworks are much closely related to real life, right? They're, they're more down to earth <laughs> when it comes to actually implemented uh, real security functions. And on what exactly are you going to find inside the inside of a framework? We're going to find a lot of things and you can actually access most of these that we've talked about for free online. But just to cover a couple of the major topics here. First of all, we're going to find things such as acceptable use policy or so known as fair use policy sometimes. This one, this one is a policy that says how you're allowed to use certain resources in your company. It's things like computers, how you should use the internet, how you should use the phones even mobile phones, right? Uh, usually the main idea of such a policy is that you shouldn't be using anything that belongs to the company for illegal purposes or for things that might create mm, tension. <laughs> Let's say tension. Well, things like propaganda, you know, spam or for uh, or running your own business, your own side business, okay? Uh, also make sure you enforce an AUP, an acceptable use policy, because uh, if it's not enforced, and people know about this, it's like it's not there, okay? So you're gonna need some technology controls in there, not just the policy, because people don't really listen and they'll try to bypass, you know, those policy that make them unhappy or uncomfortable. Another one might be the code of conduct, also known as code of ethics. This is somewhat related to the acceptable use policy. Uh, so it's basically the, with great power comes great responsibility clause. Uh, the code of conduct is the uh, expectation to behave ethically, even when you are a privileged user. So it should include conditions such as you should only perform authorized job functions, not 
something else on the side. Uh, you should take care to protect the uh, confidentiality, the integrity of the data that you own, that you manage. Um, you should take care to uh, to secure things like account credentials, don't share them, stuff like that. You should also be aware of compliance requirements and you shouldn't try to shortcut them. Again, we're, we're reaching into that ethics area. And you should also respect the privacy of others, even when you have access to their personal profiles, their, their email data and browsing history perhaps if you're part of the IT department, as you can probably guess. Next up, we have the privacy. And privacy is generally expected by anyone, at least up to a certain level. Everybody expects a certain right to privacy. But it has to be balanced if we need to actually see what's going on and enforce some policies based on this type of monitoring. So first of all, privacy should be signed and agreed upon by all the employees. Everybody should know that they are being surveilled, for example, in the workplace, right? So employees do have their rights to be monitored or not. And this type of uh, monitoring can be done for a number of reasons, which of course should be specified in this, uh, in this privacy document. Uh, first of all, we could do this for security assurance because we could be doing workplace surveillance to just look for security incidents and that's it. Secondly, we could be doing it to monitor data or to monitor the employee productivity. Oh, well, this is the type of monitoring that people don't really like, right? We could also be doing it as, as a purely physical monitoring, as in uh, just to check how many people uh, are currently in the open space, how many people have checked in, how many people came to work, right? <laughs> in a Thursday, for example, right? What's the behavior? Where exactly are they present and so on? Ownership is about data. Of course, so we're going to address the security of data as well. As you know from the previous videos, if you create the data, you own that data, so you are the data owner. Now, data is used in business workflows, right? So in order to be used inside of a workflow, we need to classify data first, especially by sensitivity level. So we need to know what kind of data we have access to and we are allowed to use and how. Now, I have a big problem here because, uh, again, we're running into those privileged users like admin users, root users. And this policy is the only thing protecting you from those admins developing superpowers and taking ownership of your data. So sometimes you actually have those, uh, those absolute privileges over data or over somebody's personal information. And the only thing that stops you as an admin from doing bad stuff with that data is, is a policy, is the, the threat of a legal action or of a fine or of being fired. The backup policy should be addressed as well. So in uh, simple terms, right, short-term backup, uh, we're talking here about things like file versioning. It's good if you want to revert to a previous version. It's sort, sort of a backup, actually. Versioning is not exactly backup, but it's still sort of a backup. It allows you to recover from accidental deletions of files or data, and it allows you to sometimes even recover from uh, ransomware based on crypto lockers, which encrypt the contents of your disks. On the long term, well, you're usually going to do this for legal requirements, other policies that might be implemented in there to abide by certain standards and so on. And also within the backup policy, there should be some mentions about how the destruction process should be performed when we don't need that data anymore. Now, it really doesn't have to be a very complicated destruction process, but it has to be adequate to the sensitivity of the data that we're trying to destroy. And finally, we have job-related security functions here that should be addressed. Things like separation of duties, right? A job rotation, rotating multiple people over the same positions in your company so that there's no collusion happening in there where people don't, uh, you know, get used to their, their privileges too long and start abusing them. We should also address things like mandatory vacation. If you think this, this is required again, this is against, you know, overstepping your privileges. And with mandatory vacation, when somebody else comes in and, you know, takes over your job for at least two weeks or so, if you are doing something nasty in there, the risks of it being discovered are high, right? So <laughs> if we force people to go on vacation, uh, we're basically signaling them that they shouldn't be doing anything nasty on the job uh, because when they're on a beach, it might be visible to somebody else. 
A dual control means that, especially for uh, very restricted privilege, it's high privileged operations, we're going to need two people to perform an action in order to be considered an administrative action. So that we need two people to agree before moving forward. Again, we're doing this against privilege abuse. Two people might be tougher to uh, threaten, to convince, to persuade than one. A uh, least privilege principle. We are on video number 56 on this security training. I honestly hope I don't need to explain again what is the least privilege principle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and finally, don't forget to audit all these permissions, all these policies, uh, because things change. Uh, people change, requirements change, new data is introduced, new systems are introduced every single day, right? So you need to adapt as well, right? Don't run your company using policies written 10 years ago, mentioning systems and types of data that don't even exist nowadays. Now, corporate policies are those policies that usually come from the upper management. And they are initiated first by creating awareness at the management level so that you get the support from management to to publish this kind of uh, this kind of policy. And of course, the management has to approve any kind of change to your security policy as well. So that's also going to be a type of policy that comes down from upper management. Also, creating management awareness and convincing management to take action can help a lot from a legal standpoint as well. If a bad security incident happens, there's proof for due care and due diligence that management did its job properly. And such a policy should state clearly the goals and responsibilities for each department. So, for example, technical department like the, you know, the CTO might be responsible for defining the policy. The, uh, the HR department uh, should be responsible perhaps to ensure training and dissemination of that information to all the employees. The operations department should be tasked with implementing the security controls that correspond to the policy and so on. And as much as possible, these security policies should be secret on a need to know basis, right? We shouldn't provide any sensitive info to potential attackers. And so not everybody needs to know how the IDS or the firewall policies look like in the companies that they work in. So we talked about policies, we should mention procedures as well. Now procedures are much easier to understand. Procedure is basically just a list of steps. Now a couple of uh, examples of procedures that you might have in place. First of all, these procedures are oftentimes found as compensating controls. Remember this topic from a while ago? So a compensating control is the control that you're using when you cannot implement the right control to secure that specific type of data or that specific information, right? When you don't have the necessary and or the technical expertise or the money to invest into a technical solution to protect data, well, the least you can do is to actually specify a procedure of how that data should be handled, right? You're just telling people, you know, be careful where you leave that data, how you access it, how you encrypt it or how you decrypt it. If you don't have an appliance or some sort of an application to do this for you. So this is sometimes the reason why procedures are considered to be a type of compensating control. So long story short, if you cannot protect it, you just rely on people following the right procedures, especially helpful for internal threats. Continuous monitoring is also a type of procedure that should be performed on a daily basis. Good documentation, not just about you no know, programming and code and such, but a documentation of all the moves as changes that pertain to your network, to your systems and to your security policies. This is also part of a procedure that should be followed in order to make sure that nobody forgets to update the documentation. A control testing is another type of procedure. How do we test whatever type of security control we're about to implement in the network before we actually add that device or that policy into the inside of a network? How do we test a new firewall, for example? That's a procedure. A change management, pretty obvious. That's basically the definition of a procedure, right? <laughs> Having a list of steps that describe how we're supposed to replace devices, how you're supposed to upgrade them, how you're supposed to roll back if something goes wrong, stuff like that. And also the change management procedures might include some exceptions as well. For example, for management, just to give you an example, you might want to include some exceptions from the bring your own device policy for top management, a patching, updating, 
right? Again, this is the type of procedure that should be strictly followed. And finally, we should address a procedure whenever we need to retire technology. Whenever technology becomes obsolete, we don't need it anymore, or we simply want to replace it. What do we do with the old stuff? Right? That's a procedure as well. How do we decommission software, hardware, or even how do we decommission people, right? <laughs> how do we fire people? And since we just mentioned exceptions, well, how do you deal with exceptions? In some situations, your, your policies might be required to bypass specific personnel, especially high-ranked ones. There is not much you can do about this except properly document and then implement that exception, right? At a minimum, you should at least keep track of who and what business processes were affected by that exception, uh, what kind of personnel was involved, uh, what are the reasons for the exception? Because later on, you might have to review those exceptions and decide if they should still be in there. A risk assessment showing that you have done your homework and that everybody agrees that the exception is going to add some risk. And that risk is acceptable. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. Otherwise, the exception is not going to happen. And also the duration of the exception. For how long should we uh, expect this exception <laughs> to last in, uh, in our company? And what are the steps to roll back to compliance when we don't need that exception anymore? All right, so that's it about security frameworks. Not the most stellar topic in the size of plus, I know, and I'm sorry about this, but you really need to know this stuff at least for the exam. And part of it, actually, it's not that bad. I mean, I, I try to present it in a way that it actually makes sense. So try to apply logic and common sense to these questions, except when they're asking you about acronyms. And you know, the acronyms, you just have to know them. Sorry about that again. <laughs> All right, so uh, make sure you review what we just talked about. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and see you next time because next time we're gonna be talking about continuity planning and risk assessment, right? So again, we're pretty getting closer to the end of the training and we're coming back down to earth and talking about more realistic stuff when it comes to you know disasters and incident response. All right, so see you next time because that one is gonna be a much more interesting video. Bye-bye.